We will be in Romans chapter 14 this morning. Those that have not been with us on Wednesday nights, Romans has been a fun trip. It's been a it's a book that I and many others have always said is if we lost every, every, the rest of the Bible, we'd be okay with just Romans. It covers many of the core topics that we need to remember and keep close to our hearts as we live out our days on this planet trying to serve Jesus. And as we've looked, Paul has dove into what our salvation is, what it took to get there, what our relationship with God is. And now that we're in the tail end of the book here, we are starting, we've been diving into, okay, now we understand our relationship with God. What is our relationship with each other? And often that is the harder part. And so as we get into 14 here, we're going to look into several topics of just our relationship with one another. And to start that out, let's take a hypothetical situation. Let's say we have a farmer's market down here on the square. You go down there and you're looking through and you see all these you know, garden-grown vegetables are usually it's a pretty decent price on them. Corn, tomatoes, cucumbers, many of, the, many of the common things you see. And then you see a nice refrigerated trailer out there. And it's loaded down with meat. All kinds of beef. Every cut you can think of. And as you get closer and you take a look at the prices on it, and it's like 50 cents a pound for some of these cuts. You're like, what is going on here? And amazing, how do you even afford to sell it at that? And then this shady looking guy says, well, this meat was used in a sacrifice to our Lord Cthulhu. How many would still buy it? That's the thing. Does this offend your salvation in any way? Does it affect it? If you buy this bargain deal of meat that just happened to be used in a cult, would that affect your salvation? Does that affect your relationship with the Lord? Though it does not, this act wouldn't necessarily mean you're not going to heaven. It's a matter of conscience for the individual. And this is kind of the scenario that Paul is going to propose to us here. Not necessarily a refrigerated truck in Cthulhu from Lovecraft mythos, <laughs> but the moral question of what we will see as usually a debatable topic. There's many other debatable topics in our faith. And we've been arguing back and forth for 2,000 years on some of this stuff. But as we, we're going to look into, we're going to see Paul makes a distinguish, makes, distinguishes between the debatable and the not debatable. Where we stand with one another in these bickering arguments. Starting off verse 1 of chapter 14 here. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Stopping right there. So, the question that they had here was similar to the scenario I just gave you. They're in Rome. Christianity is a new faith. It's not like the Rome today where it's the Catholic Church pretty much owns it. This was a new idea. 
and what Rome had going on, as with much of the region and much of many places around the world at that time, animal sacrifice was a thing. Didn't it? Whatever God calls for a sacrifice, these people would do a sacrifice. Not all of it would get burnt up. What do you do with the meat? Do you just toss it? No, you take it down to the market and put it out, up for discount. New York Strip. On sale 50% off because it was offered up to Mars or whatever. You know, it was given, offered up in a sacrifice to a god. The problem they were having is, should you be partaking in such, a sac such things? Should you be eating stuff that was offered to another god? And Paul is saying here, it is the question that you have. That is a moral question for the individual. And what he's getting at is, all things have been made clean. We, there is no dietary restriction to the Christian. None that has been mandated. But for some, the idea that you are giving your money to someone that is worshiping another god, that hits their conscience too hard. What Paul's saying here is, that's fine. The Lord is telling them they shouldn't do it. Don't look down on them for it. Same with you that decides that you will partake in these things. Just because you don't want to doesn't mean they have to hold that restriction themselves. Your conscience doesn't affect their conscience. It is a separate issue. It's a debatable issue. Let's step away from a dietary restriction for a minute and think of any other philosophical, theological debate we have in the church. One that immediately jumps to mind is the tribulation. When is the rapture? This one divides churches and families. Does Christ come before the tribulation? In the middle of it? After? I have my opinion. And if I come to that topic and teach it, then I will teach what I believe. I might make some people mad. But the idea is it's a debatable issue. It doesn't affect your salvation. We can debate back and forth, but don't hate one another over such petty things. The rapture will happen and somebody will be proven right and wrong and we'll figure it out then. Till then, read, study, understand the way you understand it. Another issue is baptism. There is entire denominations on the, the idea of baptism. Does it save you? Does it not? Now we have a problem. Because now we're debating how salvation works. That is the key to whether it's a debatable issue or not. Because we're taught in Romans just weeks ago, your salvation is Christ crucified. Do you accept that free gift? Do you call him Lord of your life? Do you confess that he is the one to save you? Do you believe that? That's salvation. Anything else, you're saying that that wasn't enough, that Christ wasn't enough. And that is a dividing issue. Am I saying we don't need to get baptized? No, we were told to do it. But it doesn't change your salvation. And that is what Paul is getting at. Is these other issues, do you sprinkle a baby with, with water for a baptism or do you have to go down to an actual river and dunk somebody? That's debatable. Figure it out. Follow your conscience. What is the Lord telling you? He gives another example here. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord. And he who gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat. And he gives thanks for God. He gives another example of holidays. Another topic that was being debated because 
If you've ever followed Orthodox Judaism, there's a holiday like every three weeks. Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Tents, the Sabbaths, the Passover, all these different high holidays that they, the Jews were following. They were jumping back to the same issue we saw in Acts 15 over circumcision. They were saying, if you don't follow this, you're not Christian. And see, that's what Paul's getting at. It's like, we're done with that. Those days, those feasts, they are all pointing to what we've already got. And that's Christ. Now, is it a problem that you want to observe the Sabbath? If you want to observe these feasts throughout the year? No, it's not a problem. By all means. But don't hold your brother accountable, your sister accountable for the same thing because it is your conviction. It doesn't affect their salvation. And so, okay, one brother says the Sabbath should be on Saturday. The other one says it should be on Sunday. One says it should be a Tuesday. Doesn't matter. Are you a brother in Christ? Do you have your salvation? Are you a member of the God's family? That's all that matters. Christ is our Sabbath. And therefore, it's not necessary to bicker and squabble over such a petty thing. Do they believe? Are they here with you? Are they family? That's all that matters. This can be taken as far. Hey, we don't have to celebrate Christmas. You don't have to celebrate Easter. These are holidays set up for us to remember. It's not a necessary thing for your salvation. Verse 7 here, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For he will, we will all stand before God, before the judgment seat of God. So what we're looking at here is all these things are meant for one thing and one thing only. To worship God. To honor God. So it's not a matter okay Glenn decides he doesn't want to eat anymore and this is a dedication to God that he is going to go vegetarian. I'm not to harp on him and say you're living you're living in weakness. You don't have enough faith. No, that's between him and God. It don't matter. Let him serve God the way he's feeling called. It is a matter of your conviction and your choice on the matter. Are you serving the Lord in this matter? Because at the beginning here, he speaks of those that are weak in faith. There are some that need a list of rules to follow to keep themselves on track. That is fine. As long as it's not a matter of salvation. As long as it's a matter of how they choose to serve the Lord. Many in here choose not to drink. Whether that is past addictions or simply they feel God says you shouldn't do it. One way or the other, it's a matter of how they are being called to serve. Because in the end, who is the one that is, makes the final judgment? God. We will all stand in before the judgment seat of God. So whether or not they're 
convictions were out of what they felt they needed to do to serve God or if it was for show to show off to everybody else. God will make that judgment. As long as you are following the convictions the Spirit is putting on your heart. But there's one step further to this conundrum here, and we'll look at it. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. There's, a, there's the thing. Paul is calling us to take it one step further. Not to judge one another on their choices and what they believe is right. Allie decides she doesn't want to drink any more alcohol ever again. It is her choice. She feels God is telling her not to touch another drink. Is it showing love for me to bring home a six-pack after her, her making that decision? No. Same as the one that chooses not to eat meat. You inviting them for barbecue. You're putting a stumbling block in their way. You're saying, hey, I give no regard to what you are feeling called to do. Don't put someone that is weak in their faith. They, they, need, they need this to maintain their faith and then you step all over it. Same as being judgmental. I've been in several churches that I would be thrown out dressed the way I am right now. Shorts and sandals? In the house of God? How dare you? Have you no regard? But you know what? If I'm going to go to their sanctuary and worship with them, they feel a need that you should be dressed to the nines to be in church. I should respect that. Because that is what they feel they are called. And I'm not kidding. I've actually been thrown out of a church for showing up in shorts before. <laughs> so it is a matter of showing love by respecting those decisions. Showing love by respecting these limitations that your brother or sister has. And we're not saying that you're called to follow the same thing, but show respect. Don't judge them. Don't harp down on them. Love them. Say, okay, I want, I want to help you in this. Paul himself wrote that he would never touch meat again if it meant one person's salvation. If it kept one brother on the path to Christ, fine, I won't touch it again. It's not because he has a problem with it, but his brother needs that. He needs that respect. I know in and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. But do not destroy with food him for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating, drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There is no dietary restrictions. There's no Christ has set us free from that. But some can't handle that level of freedom. They need rules. They need guidance. And that is not a problem. And we should respect that. Don't harp down on them and basically drive them away from Christ thinking 
because I'm not strong enough for this or that that I'm not deserving. Christ died for all of us. And therefore, we should love one another equally. And so, simply in that, respect one another in their walk. And as he said, it's maybe perfectly fine for me to eat meat. It may be perfectly fine if I want to have a drink. But I shouldn't do that in front of, around another brother who struggles in that. I should show love. Respect them. If a brother has a problem with drinking, I shouldn't invite him to the, a bar to have lunch. That's just asking for problems. Respect them. Love them. I've come across many of, I guess the proper way we call them a theologian, one that's heavily involved in the study of the Word of God. But I've known some that are vehemently, they speak in venom towards another person because they disagree on the interpretation of a single verse. I've also heard of horror stories where a church is divided and split off because they couldn't agree on the color of carpet. These divisions shouldn't be. And simply right here is where they should have been looking. We can go back and forth and debate and reason one another on any topic. But the one that we should hold our ground on is simply Christ crucified. Simple enough, that is it. That is all that is required for your salvation. That is the only thing that truly matters. Any other point of debate, we can debate back and forth. We can go on hours, days, weeks discussing it. But there shouldn't be hatred towards one another in that debate. Glenn and I can disagree on, on biblical points. The point is that we come together and discuss it. We sit down, hash it out. Not out of hatred, not out of anger. We might get frustrated because we can't understand one another. But it should be out of love that we come to a consensus. Jesus is the key point, is the only point that matters. His sacrifice. Everything else, it's debatable. We can work back and forth on it. We can hash it out. We can figure it out. What's the proper way to have communion? Should there be rock music in, in the worship service? These are all things that can be debated and worked out. That is the thing. Christ crucified. That is what matters. Where your salvation is, as long as we can agree on that, the rest of it can be worked out in love and respect. Verse 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. We should be building up. We should be supporting one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. A dietary restriction is not the reason to destroy the, <laughs> the family of God. All things indeed are clean. There is no restriction on diet. but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. So, alcohol can be an evil thing to some. Others, it's just another drink. doesn't matter. doesn't phase them. I know many people that 
can crack a Bud Light, drink it, and done. I know others, if they get near a liquor store, they might go bankrupt. Is alcohol a sin? As we just read right there, there is nothing unclean. But for some, it is a sin. God has called them not to touch it anymore. You can't handle it. Don't touch it. For them, it is a sin. And so we should be showing love and support in these things. <clears throat> so to not eat meat or drink wine or do anything which causes your brothers to stumble, simply show love. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So we're getting back to a measure of faith. Everybody's been given a different measure of faith. And when I say a measure of faith, it doesn't mean that I have more faith than someone else. Barney isn't more faithful than I am, it's just as much as I'm not more faithful than he is. Each person has been given a path that they're going to walk on for God. He's leading them. Each one leads through the cross for salvation. But just as each person is different in their own ways, so is their convictions and what they have to follow. I learned the hard way that I have the conviction of I got to be in service every chance I get. I walked down that path where I didn't think being in the sanctuary was a big deal. I can read the Bible. Next thing I know, I haven't been in church in two years. I didn't even know where my Bible was. I spent more time at a bar drinking than I did even considering God. I know my conviction is I got to be here to renew my faith, to strengthen myself, to keep myself on track. That's what I need. That may not be the case for anyone else in here. But I highly recommend that you come in, you fellowship with the other believers, be with the family, learn from somebody else. Having someone else simply explain the scriptures is remarkably brings clarity. I may not do a very good job of it. I try. But each person has their convictions. Mine is I need to be here as often as I can. If I start slacking off, I start finding more excuses. <clears throat> so for me, to make an excuse not to be here is a sin. For me. Because I know that is a weakness I have. Now yours may be a something else. God is calling each one of us to serve in some way, to worship Him, to believe in Him, to follow Him in our own way. And if God, the Lord has told you not to do something, you do it. That is a sin. That's simply sin, the disobedience to God. But he who doubts is condemned. If he eats because he is eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. So whatever you're doing against your convictions, it's sin. Whether your conviction is that you can't listen to a preacher that doesn't have a pulpit in front of him, hey, if that is honestly throwing your faith off, Find somewhere that has a pulpit. But I would just ask, is it is such a, a minor issue worth a division? And 
Now, I know there's several Calvary chapels that, you know, look far more like your Southern Baptist church. Preachers in a suit and behind a pulpit. We tend to try to be more relaxed here. I shared some videos of some of my teachings with a coworker a few months back. And he said, his exact words is, the teaching was good, but we don't follow a denomination like yours. And I, was, I looked at him, I'm like, what, what does that supposed to mean? It's like, well, it doesn't even look like you're at a church. It looks like you're a motivational speaker walking back and forth on a stage. My appearance and how relaxed was preventing him from actually paying attention to the words. If that is that big of a deal, then fine. Go somewhere else. Find someone else. Find those that you can connect with and they, they're not putting a stumbling block in the way. Now, I personally, I find it far more relaxed the way we do things here. But I grew up this way. This is church to me. Now, I had a few trips to church before my family found God. And yes, I had to put on a blazer and dress pants and put on a tie, and I hated it. (laughs) But then to have a preacher tell me that that isn't salvation, that isn't God. That was what was remarkable to me. That it wasn't do this, do that. It wasn't a set of rules. It was a relationship. That God was someone you could know. Someone you could talk to. Someone that would guide you. Couldn't believe it. But it was simply taking those stubbly blocks away that was enough to lead me. And so I ask you, is, is a brother or sister struggling at something? Have you been callous to not respect it? It may not be a sin for you, but the, this person, they're struggling. Help them along. If wine is a problem, drinking is a problem for someone, don't drink around them. Simply show respect in it. If you honestly have someone that has a spiritual conniption about eating meat, then don't invite them to the barbecue later. Get together with them without it. Sit down with them. Be with them. Hash out. Is this What, what is this? How can I help you in it? Same with anyone here. If you have some, a limitation that you have to abide by this to feel like you're closer to God, that is your conviction. You shouldn't look at someone else judgmental. And so, simply this. It's not a matter of rules and regulation. Simply salvation, Christ crucified, His gracious gift given to us is the matter at hand. Everything is a debatable issue. But we should go back and forth on these debatable issues out of love. Yes, <clears throat> there's many that major on minors. I just ask that whatever it is that you've been having any kind of division between another here, are you majoring on a minor? Are you allowing a petty thing to put division instead of coming to consensus, working together? So just simply, show love to one another. 
come together, hash out the debatable issues. If you can't come to a consensus on whether or not Christ comes before or after the tribulation, agree to disagree. We can work out those issues, but the one thing that is key is Christ crucified. Everything else, it's not worth the division. Let's hash it out, agree to disagree, move on. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for another time to just learn from you, to dive into your word, to be able to explore what it is to serve you, to follow you. Lord, I just ask that we, we find a coming together, a, a harmony w- within the family of God, that whether it be in this sanctuary or with the, sa- the congregation across town, that there is no division. Christ crucified, this sacrifice and the salvation is all that truly matters. And outside of that, if we can just come together to learn from one another and to learn more of you, Lord, I just ask for a blessing on everyone here as we continue on our day and just ask that you bless each and every person here. In Jesus' name I pray.